Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Breast Cancer COVID-19 Conundrum. I am Panita Khanna, Director of Community Relations at Dr. Susan Love Foundation for Breast Cancer Research. At Dr. Susan Love Foundation for Breast Cancer Research, we challenge the status quo to end breast cancer through our innovative research and improve the lives of those impacted through education and advocacy. At this time, I would like to introduce you to our panelists, Dr. Susan Love Foundation Medical Advisor, Dr. Stephanie Graff. She is also the Director of the Breast Program and Clinical Research Program at Sarah Cannon Cancer Institute at HCA Midwest Health. Hi everyone, nice to meet you. <laughs> we also have Dr. Susan Love Foundation Medical Advisor, Dr. Lauren Green. Dr. Green is also the Division Head of Breast Imaging at University of Illinois Hospital and Health Sciences System. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. And finally, Dr. Mary Jennifer Markham, Chief and professor at the University of Florida Division of Hematology and Oncology and Associate Director for Medical Affairs at the University of Florida Health Cancer Center. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Before we start the program, we want to offer this disclaimer. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice from your physician. We recommend consulting with your medical provider to discuss your specific concerns. This webinar will be recorded and will be sent to our attendees and will also be available on our website. If you have any questions, please enter them in our Q&A and we will do our best to get to them at the end of the presentation. And now we begin the presentation with Dr. Markham. Great, thank you so much. Let's go to the, actually, let's leave it here for a moment. So I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking to you about the impact of COVID-19 on how cancer care has uh, really changed in the way we deliver it um, since the beginning of the pandemic. Next slide, please. So um, this may give you all a little bit of a flashback. This was the newspaper from Thursday, March 12th, 2020, when the WHO declared COVID-19 a pandemic. And, and what I will share with you is that physicians had been keeping a close eye on um, this virus and the disease that it causes um, since probably early January or February when we first learned of uh, COVID-19. Uh, but there was a, a period where we really were learning a lot on a day-to-day -day basis, and that's uncommon in medicine. Typically, we have lots of time to uh, review research studies and uh, come up with really the best evidence to support what we do. And this changed that. Um, we learned rapidly how to proceed in the time of a um, very easily and rapidly spreading pandemic. Next slide, please. So oncologists in particular kept an eye on what was happening in the areas that were first impacted by COVID-19. As we all know, the disease or the virus began or was first identified in China. And um, luckily, uh, physicians and scientists all over the world in China and then in Italy and then later in the United States when the virus was detected in Washington state initially, scientists and physicians shared their findings. They shared quickly how they were uh, changing their own practices and protecting themselves and protecting their patients. And I think this was a bit unprecedented in our time. Next slide, please. So lots of things changed and some of these things are uh, still in place and many have gone away. But early in the pandemic, we were quite concerned about exposing patients to this virus because of the potential risk. And so telemedicine quickly became an option. This is the availability of doing virtual visits. And we really didn't have this to a large degree before the pandemic. 
many of us delayed appointments for our patients. Um, and many of you on the webinar today may have had appointments delayed or canceled um, in order to keep your exposure to the healthcare system down. Elective surgeries were postponed. And a lot of the reason for this was really to create space in the hospital for the, the numbers of patients we all anticipated having to come in because of this virus. Screening tests were delayed, including mammograms and colonoscopies and pap smears. Administration of supportive care medications that are typically given in an, an infusion center, such as bone strengthening agents, were delayed. Those were not felt to be critical, and those are um, were felt to be things that really could safely be postponed until the healthcare system was in a more stable environment. Something that I think a lot of us were concerned about was that clinical trials were put on hold. And uh, this was multifactorial, but essentially clinical trials and rolling into clinical trials for cancer treatment does involve a lot of extra people in the building, uh, in the clinic setting, and lots of extra visits potentially for patients. And we want, did not want to increase risk to our patients. And then finally, cancer treatments were themselves modified, either changing the, the, um, the regimen entirely or the sequencing. Next slide, please. So some of the things that were done to cancer treatments really were done primarily to minimize the risk to that individual with cancer by decreasing exposure to the virus. And so um, in uh, breast cancer, for example, sometimes the order of chemotherapy or surgery was changed. So uh, at our institution, for example, chemotherapy was uh, given more frequently first, followed by surgery. And I, I think this uh, also was important during that time when surgeries were being postponed. Infusion treatments were delayed. So if a treatment uh, perhaps was given every three weeks, sometimes we were able to stretch that to every four weeks. And then again, um, stretching out the length between treatments or even delay in starting treatments. So for cancers, for example, where uh, treatment could safely be delayed for a couple of weeks. We tried to do that in order to, to really prevent a patient from having an unnecessary risk to a virus that we all believed and uh, believed to be quite deadly. Next slide, please. So physicians were in a, a, a bit of a tough spot. I think we've all been in a tough spot with this pandemic, but our decision-making was especially challenging in the beginning. Uh, and, and really the beginning in my mind was that, you know, February, March, April of 2020, um, and then into the early summer of 2020. We really were debating and trying to decide whether the risks of deferring a cancer treatment or testing versus not deferring, we, we needed to decide which was safest for the patient. Clearly, we needed to balance the, the risk of uh, not making a cancer diagnosis in time or not treating a cancer diagnosis in time to achieve that best result for the patient. But we also didn't want to make our patients sicker or at higher risk of dying. And there were lots of unknowns in the beginning of the pandemic. What we do know is that people with cancer who develop COVID-19 tend to have worse outcomes. Not everyone, but some groups of patients with cancer tend to have worse outcomes from COVID-19. We did not want to make that worse with cancer treatment, with immune suppression, or somehow interfering with you know, the body's ability to fight this virus. It was a very tricky situation, and I'm very happy we are uh, now um, at the benefit of having much more knowledge. Next slide, please. So what I'm showing you here is a slide from an article that was published uh, just a month ago in the JAMA Oncology Journal, uh, which is where a lot of important cancer research is public, uh, published. And what I wanted to show you was, um, if you will look at um, B, which is in the upper right corner of the screen, it shows you the numbers of screening tests. And I, I, the numbers are not so relevant. But if you'll just notice where those bars are, they're very uh, close to that zero range. They're not over the 10,000 range. And if you looked at the same three months in 2019, that's D, which is just below in the bottom right, you will see what it was prior to the pandemic. 
So cancer screening tests um, really dropped off and this uh, did lead to um, more advanced cancers being diagnosed and less early stage cancers being picked up in a timely fashion. Next slide, please. So what are we doing now and what have we learned? Well, many places still have reduced numbers of visitors. And this still is because COVID is uh, clearly rampant in some parts of the country still and definitely in some countries. Um, so reducing the number of visitors helps to keep exposure down. I think this is likely to evolve as time goes on and as more people are vaccinated. Many of you uh, who have had appointments during this past year have been pre-screened for COVID-19 symptoms prior to your appointment, and this is still ongoing. Uh, this, of course, doesn't pick up the asymptomatic patient, the person who doesn't know they have COVID. And then screening for symptoms on arrival to their appointment. So uh, screening for fever, for example, or cough or other respiratory symptoms. Telemedicine has uh, really become commonplace it is less common now, I think in areas where COVID is um, more under control, but it remains an option. And I think it is a nice option, especially for people who um, really have a difficult time getting out of the home or driving into an appointment. Wearing masks, of course, we all are doing, and then using hand, san hand sanitizer and washing hands um, regularly is important, although, the, what we know is that this virus is transmitted more by air. And so we don't have to, we don't have to wipe off our groceries anymore. We did learn that we can avoid doing that. Physical distancing whenever possible. So in the hospital setting or in a clinic setting, um, um, part of the reason to reduce visitors is also to be able to improve the ability to, to keep distances between people. Hospitals and clinics are also requiring employees and healthcare workers to stay home when sick. This seems like a no brainer, like a very obvious thing that should have been happening all along. Um, but I would suspect um, that Dr. Graf and Dr. Green might, might back me on this, that many of us have a history of, you know, with a minor cold, we might still go into work because it's just a cold. We cannot do that with COVID. And so um, that has been a major uh, shift in, I think, uh, culture. It is important to stay home when you're sick, regardless of the work you do. And then finally, vaccinations, and this is a game changer, and you'll hear more about vaccinations in a moment. Next slide. So I would say that cancer care is now back to normal or really whatever our, our new normal is. Clearly, we're still dealing with the pandemic. Uh, it has not gone away. Um, and local trans, uh, transmission rates in the community will clearly impact what is happening in your local hospitals and cancer uh, clinics. But really, on-time cancer screenings are encouraged. We know how to protect you when you come to the radiology clinic or um, to the endoscopy suite for your colonoscopy. So it is very important to keep cancer screenings on time. Having procedures to diagnose cancer, such as biopsies, and cancer treatments, such as radiation or chemotherapy or immunotherapy, are all safe to continue in the hospital setting or the clinic setting. COVID testing prior to surgeries or hospitalization is the one thing obviously that we did not do prior to the pandemic. And this is happening to different degrees based on risk in the area and, and certain hospital protocols. And then finally, cancer clinical trials are ongoing. They are back up and running. And clinical trials are obviously always important and they remain more important, uh, as important as ever. Next slide, please. So I will wrap up by saying we've learned a lot. This period of time on the, uh, the far left of each of this graph is March of, of 20. And we thought we were seeing major cases then. And as it turns out, we, we really weren't. Um, but what we do know is that um, we learn more every day. There has been lots of information that has now been published in the medical journals. We are still learning. And clearly right now, the big area that we um, must focus on is vaccination. And this is an area that we will um, learn more about uh, today on our webinar. Next slide. Thank you. So I'm gonna be talking through the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, next. Uh, 
just at a glance, real quick level, high level, um, there's three vaccines that are approved in the US. Um, Pfizer um, or the BioNTech um, vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, and what most of us consider the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is technically the Janssen vaccine, according to the FDA. Um, their mechanism of action, both Pfizer and Moderna, are mRNA virus, uh, uh, mRNA-based um, vaccines, and the Johnson & Johnson is an adenovirus vector. Uh, Moderna and Pfizer are both two doses of vaccine. Pfizer 21 days apart, three weeks. Moderna 28 days apart or four weeks. Uh, J&J &J is approved in the US as a one-shot vaccine. They do, they are collecting data on a two-shot series, um, which the two-shot series is given 28 days apart. And we will wait for that data and potentially a second approval. Um, they are all approved for uh, young, young adults, 18 and older uh, through um, adulthood. Pfizer's approval goes down to age 16. You can see that the number of uh, persons that participated in these studies was very high. We saw over 30,000 volunteers participate in the clinical research that led to the approval of these vaccines. Uh, with half of those participants receiving the vaccine and half of those participants receiving the placebo on, on average. And you can see that there was really good diversity in the clinical trial enrollment compared to what we see uh, for many studies. Um, about half the participants were male to female ratios in all three studies. Um, about 20% or so of both the Pfizer and the Moderna study were non-white participants. Um, and J&J, &J, which was uh, studied in large part um, in outside of the United States, had a much higher diversity uh, with about 40% of the vaccine participants being non-white um, background. And so I think that that gives us a lot of good data about how these vaccines are going to um, affect people differently um, when we see good diversity of enrollment. And then we can see that their efficacy dates are just, uh, rates are just unparalleled. It was so exciting as a physician living in the pandemic, as a mother living in the pandemic, as a daughter living in the pandemic, to uh, see these efficacy date uh, rates as they rolled out. Pfizer re reported their efficacy at seven days after the second vaccine at 95%. The Moderna uh, reported at 14 days post the second vaccine at 94.1%, and the J&J &J vaccine at 14 days after the first shot was 76%. Interestingly, that 14 days after a single shot um, efficacy is actually similar to what we see with Pfizer and Moderna, where even for the population only receiving uh, one vaccine of those two, um, they already have really good efficacy, although you can obviously significantly enhance your efficacy by going in and getting that second vaccine, uh, which is how they were approved and how I would encourage you to receive those. Next. So, you know, a lot of times patients say, well, why should I do this or why should I be uh, getting the vaccine? And what I would say is, come on, everybody's doing it. Everyone's a vaccine, the cool kids. Um, right now, um, look at the percent of the population. We have 40% of the US population as of April 21st, uh, who has received at least one dose of the vaccine. Um, and fully vaccinated 87,000, or sorry, 87,000 million, 400, sorry, 592,646 people or 26% of adult Americans. Um, so those are just really exciting numbers. You can see that the, the percent uh, vaccinated goes much higher in that age 65 plus group. Um, as of course, those were the uh, people who were allowed to get vaccinated in those sort of first waves um, as we rolled out beyond essential workers to um, age-based or risk-based assessment. Next. So just to talk through how these vaccines work a lot, I think that that's a question that I get and a misunderstanding perhaps because it's hard for the lay press to capture this in a headline or a tweet. So an mRNA vaccine works um, by the mRNA um, is the, the protein material that encodes the spike of the COVID-19 virus. So you can see it as the, the foggy background here of the um, presentation slide. If you've seen pictures of the coronavirus, it has those little spiky balls that cover the surface of it. And that those spikes are actually what the vaccine is against. Um, 
after a person receives the vaccination, their white blood cells um, eat that mRNA that was injected and those white blood cells follow the code that they ate. So those few white blood cells that consume that small volume of um, virus eat that and then actually take up the characteristics of the, M of the coronavirus vaccine to help trigger the rest of the immune system to know that that was bad and to call out to all their white blood cell helper friends, hey, this is the thing we're attacking. Um, that immune reaction um, naturally degrades and then kills those white blood cells. And so after the original eating of those mRNAs, your body then kills those initial white blood cells and all of it's gone. Um, no genetic material enters the nucleus in any cell of your body and no live virus is involved at any point. But once those, once your initial white blood cells are consumed by your immune reaction, your body then will have the imprint of that immune reaction forever. There's an asterisk there. We don't know how long the vaccine will last in our systems yet. Um, hopefully at least a year or two, we're still waiting to see if it's long-term immunity and if we'll need boosters, but that imprint will last in our system. And as long as the COVID-19 variants continue to manifest those spikes, and so far that's true of all of the different variants that we've heard, there's not been any structural change to how those um, protein spikes are formed on the structure of the COVID capsule, these vaccines will continue to remain efficacious. Um, the adenovirus vector works. Um, it is a recombinant replication inco incompetent human adenovirus serotype 26 vector encoding a full length stabilized SARS-CoV-2 spike protein antigen. Mouthful, right? And totally makes sense. <laughs> So what does that really mean? Um, I have to kind of break it down by words. So recombinant means made in a lab. Okay, so this is a artificially created uh, vector. Replication incompetent means it's sterilized. That virus cannot divide and make new viruses in your body. Just the little tiny dose that you're given is all the virus that you have um, and it can't make more. Adenovirus serotype 26 is the particular adenovirus, which is actually relatively rare that they used to make that vector. Um, that's important because you don't want the adenovirus that they use to make the vector to be something that's super prevalent circulating in the population because you may not mount that same initial immune response if it's an adenovirus you've had a million times in your life. And the adenovirus is what we typically think of as the common cold. And so serotype 26 is very unique and we don't see in very high rates um, in, in, our, in the world, in the US especially. Um, the Oxford and AstraZeneca vaccine used a different adenovirus. They used one that's from um, chimpanzees, not the serotype 26. And the Sputnik vaccine, which is the one approved in Russia, um, actually uses two, it's a two shot series and they used adenovirus serotype 26 for the first one. And then the second one switched to serotype five um, so that persons that maybe have been exposed to 26 could still uh, mount a meaningful immune response to, um, uh, could still mount a meaningful immune, immune response to the second shot of the vaccine. Vector encoding then means that that's the part that carries the secret message. So we have a made in the lab sterilized adenovirus that carries this secret message. And the secret message it's carrying is that exact same protein spike that the mRNA was coding on the other two vaccines, except for that instead of them having the adeno or the mRNA, they're carrying the protein antigen itself. Um, after that's injected, basically the same process happens. Your white blood cells see that adenovirus vector as foreign and eat it. The white blood cell then, there's no mRNA here, so it has to convert that antigen into mRNA, then follow the code, then make the spikes, then it gets eaten by our immune system and follows that same whole cascade. So it just introduces one more step that means that we're not injecting mRNA, we're injecting a protein antigen. Next. 
Short-term safety, simply put, the vaccines are safe. Um, they are reactogenic, uh, which is my fancy doctor word that means some people feel bad for a day or so after their vaccine. They can have fatigues or headaches. Some persons will have high fevers um, or chills. Um, my husband actually had really bad chills the night after his second vaccine. Um, redness or swelling um, can occur. Um, you'll hear Dr. Green talk a lot more specifically about the adenopathy that can happen or swollen lymph nodes that can occur after the vaccine. And then some patients can have hypersensitivity reactions. Um, those hypersensitivity reactions are mediated by something called PEG, and we'll talk about this more because I think it's particularly relevant to a population like you guys that are particularly interested in cancer. Um, and that affects about two to five people per million vaccinated. Now that is really rare. That is way less common than we see with chemotherapy infusion reactions. That is way less common than, than common allergies, things like penicillin or peanut butter. Um, so the CDC says that if there is a severe reaction with dose number one, it's okay to switch from the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine over to the J&J &J vaccine for number two, because the J&J &J vaccine doesn't have that PEG um, backbone. Thromboembolic events at this point have only been described with the Johnson & Johnson um, vaccine um, or the adenovirus vector vaccines. It does seem um, also to be rare, but critically and important. And I think that we're still waiting to hear a little bit more information about those thromboembolic events. And the medical community already has been sharing and addressing how to treat and manage those thromboembolic events. Um, they do not seem to be mediated in the same way that other blood clots are. It's more of a, a rare reaction that we can see with other um, infusion events that can cause blood clotting. And so history of prior blood clots may not necessarily be a predictor in any way, shape, or form that you're at risk for that side effect. Next. Okay, so chemo infusion reactions. So remember we talked about how people who are having allergic reactions to the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna, um, are allergic to PEG. Well, PEG is actually polyethylene glycol, which is a common vehicle that we use as in the pharmacy community to make medicines liquid. And a severe allergic reaction to the vaccine or any part of it is the only contraindication to get the mRNA vaccine. So how do you know if you're allergic to PEG? Well, the family of medicines that includes PEG includes anything else that either has cremophore or polysorbate 80. And those are things that we very commonly use in our chemotherapy and are typically what people are allergic to when they're having a chemotherapy allergic reaction. So if you've ever had a chemotherapy allergic uh, allergy to paclitaxel, etoposide, or docetaxel, chances are you have a PEG allergy and will be a better candidate to get the J&J &J vaccine, which does not contain PEG. Diazepam as a liquid, cyclosporin as a liquid, propofol, which is a medicine we use to put people under anesthesia, and vitamin K also have PEG. Um, and one of the other questions is whether or not the dose matters. So the vaccine itself is only 0.5 milliliters. So it's a very, very scant amount of PEG that's being injected. Um, the dose of PEG that's in most chemotherapeutics, and this is actually the number from paclitaxel. Paclitaxel has 14 milligrams of PEG for your per body surface area. So a lot of the time somebody getting paclitaxel is getting over 100 milligrams of PEG um, injected in them. And so the difference in the total volume of polyethylene glycol that you're potentially exposed to is very different. So I would also encourage you to talk to your oncologist about your particular infusion reaction and whether or not it's worth avoiding um, the vaccines because of that or switching to the J&J &J vaccine. Next. Long-term safety, you know, we don't know. Um, what we do know is that every other vaccine um, has shown excellent long-term safety. Um, we also still don't know the long-term health risks of COVID-19 itself. We are seeing manifestations of the long haul syndrome. We're seeing patients that had severe infections 
have some chronic and potentially lifelong implications. When I think through other viral pandemics, if you think back to things like mumps or measles or, or polio, those could result in lifelong um, damage. Children that had mumps and measles were sometimes developed infertility in adulthood. People who had polio would have lifelong neurologic deficits. And so there's when we're considering the risk of the vaccine versus the risk of the virus, it's important to also acknowledge that we don't know the long-term risks of what it means to have a COVID-19 infection, particularly a, um, a severe COVID-19 infection. So if you're interested in helping gather information about long-term safety, there's two programs. Um, the um, CDC does offer something called vSafe, um, which you can download on your smartphone and they'll send you a few text message prompts um, asking you about how you're feeling to help collect that data. And then also uh, remind you about when your second dose is due. The hope is that then long-term they'll be able to uh, uh, track that up. Additionally, the C, uh, FDA sponsors the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. So if you do have a severe reaction, it's reportable and your healthcare provider can help you uh, work through that process. Next. For those of you who have cancer, truly, I think that if you did not have not received chemotherapy in the last three years, it's business as usual and you're ready to get the vaccine anytime. If you've had chemotherapy within the last three years, um, you need to talk specifically with your doctor. For patients that were treated with curative intent that have a clear end date to their chemotherapy, it may be reasonable to wait because we don't know if you're gonna have a blunted immune reaction, meaning that you may not react up to that 94% uh, immunity if you get the vaccine while you're on chemo. Um, if you are, have metastatic disease and are going to be on treatment for a long duration, um, most of medical oncologists that I know are still recommending that their patients get vaccinated, and um, but they just want to talk to their patient a little bit about the timing of the vaccine relative to either their platelet count or their white blood cell count to help make that infect that risk of um, irritation at the bleeding site and help that mount of the immune response be as hardy as possible. Um, vaccine effectiveness, again, depends on your host immune response. So if you're actively on chemo, it may not be quite up to that 94%. And if possible, um, and you know you're going to be starting chemotherapy in the future, the recommendation is to finish the series two weeks before starting uh, the vaccines uh, with, according to the CDC. Next. So when people ask um, how they can help you, I know that's a common question that cancer patients are asked regularly. I encourage you to ask your family and friends to get vaccinated. I know I'm running low on time, so I'm gonna go to the next slide and introduce Dr. Lauren Green. Hello everyone. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about breast imaging and vaccination. So breast imaging is really any test um, looking for breast cancer that involves pictures. So um, some of the more common tests include mammograms, breast ultrasounds, and breast MRIs. Next slide, please. So breast imaging and the pandemic. So there are a lot of changes to the breast, the field of breast imaging um, once the pandemic began. And Dr. Markham talked about a number of these um, items, but just briefly, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, there were a number of stay at home orders. And along with this, a number of elective medical exams and procedures were canceled. And this had a huge effect on breast imaging. Um, most of the breast imaging exams were postponed at some facilities and in particular screening mammograms. And even after many restrictions were lifted, many patients were very hesitant um, to return to their appointments, understandably due to fears about the virus. And this has led to a number of delays in breast cancer diagnoses. Next slide, please. So what has changed? Um, I'll mention just a few of the changes. Um, so at a number of institutions, they are seeing actually fewer patients per hour. And this is to help encourage social distancing. And in a lot of waiting areas, you'll see increased um, space between the seats, for instance, in order to uh, maintain social distancing, as well as restrictions on visitors. There have been changes in terms of cleaning and disinfecting. Um, they have become significantly enhanced compared to before the pandemic. 
universal masking is a is a big change. So as you can see in this image on the right, um, this is my team and everyone's wearing a mask. And so at our um, institution, everyone is required to wear a mask, um, employees, patients, and visitors to help reduce the spread of the virus. Um, there is some additional PPE or personal protective equipment that healthcare workers have been wearing. You may notice um, some healthcare workers are wearing face shields or gowns that they may not have been wearing before in addition to their masks. We are encouraging frequent ha hand washing and you've probably seen hand sanitizer everywhere um, at your medical appointments and even other places like the grocery store, for instance. And then of course, vaccination has been a major player um, in helping reduce the spread of the virus. Next slide, please. Um, so the vaccines have not been around for very long. As we've mentioned earlier, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines were approved um, for use in the general population just this past December. And then the Johnson & Johnson vaccine was approved in February of this year. Uh, there are a number of other vaccines that are being used elsewhere in the world, but are not yet approved here in the US. Next slide, please. So along with vaccines can come vaccine reactions. Um, a number of vaccines actually have expected reactions that Dr. Graf mentioned, um, some of which can include fatigue, um, soreness at the injection site, and fever, for instance. Um, my husband and my brother, unfortunately, had pretty severe um, reactions that lasted for just a couple of days, but they both had headaches um, and quite a bit of fatigue and body aches, whereas the rest of my family didn't have a very strong reaction aside from arm soreness. So it really depends person to person. These are actually appropriate reactions and signs that the immune system is doing its job. It's making antibodies to fight um, the diseases um, that the vaccine is trying to prevent. So one side, um, not really a side effect, but a reaction can be enlarged lymph nodes. And this can include um, parts of the body, particularly near the injection site. And we have seen this with older vaccines. Um, so for instance, the flu shot or the influenza vaccine has been known to cause abnormally enlarged lymph nodes or adenopathy. And this is temporary. So we have been seeing quite a few enlarged lymph nodes with the COVID-19 vaccines, and we are mainly seeing them within the underarm or axilla on the same side of the body that the vaccine was administered. And again, this is a temporary reaction, um, usually lasting about two to three weeks in most patients. And of note, these lymph nodes can be tender or painful and can even cause a lump that you may feel with your, with your hand. Um, next slide, please. So what, what exactly are lymph nodes? Um, so these are bean-shaped structures that are found throughout the body. These are a normal structure and they are a part of the immune system. So lymph nodes act as filters for substances that enter the body and they can help produce antibodies to fight infection and other diseases. And sometimes they can even contribute to fighting cancer. Um, so when the lymph nodes see something foreign, they react by enlarging. And during this process, they can temporarily become painful while they are creating the antibodies. Next slide, please. So what in the world does this have to do with cancer? Um, so in terms of breast cancer, many of the lymph nodes that filter substances that involve the breast are located in the underarm or axilla. Um, we know that lymph nodes can enlarge for a number of reasons, um, but sometimes they can enlarge when breast cancer has traveled from the breast and starts to grow within the lymph nodes. Um, so we're always on the lookout for enlarged lymph nodes um, in the realm of breast cancer. And so unfortunately, the abnormally enlarged lymph nodes that are caused by um, the COVID-19 vaccinations can actually mimic signs that we see with breast cancer. Next slide, please. So in terms of evaluating lymph nodes, um, as a radiologist, we can see these lymph nodes in the underarm on breast imaging exams. Um, we can see them often on mammograms and also other breast imaging exams like breast ultrasound or MRI. Other healthcare providers can notice these swollen lymph nodes in the underarm on a physical examination. And so if the enlarged lymph nodes are found, we do have to investigate further 
and we want to make sure that breast cancer that has spread or lymphoma are not the cause of the enlarged lymph nodes as opposed to many other common causes that are not breast cancer. Next slide, please. So here's an example of a patient. Um, this patient was coming to the breast imaging department because she was feeling a lump in her left underarm. Um, so the images on the left side of the screen are mammogram images. So just to orient you a bit, um, these images are as if the patient is standing upright and we are looking at her breast from the side, so in profile. So her head would be above the pictures and her abdomen would be below. So that sort of triangular um, white tissue at the top of the images is the pectoralis muscle. And we know that this is sort of the region of the axilla or underarm um, when we're reviewing mammograms. So if we look where the pink arrow is, we can see a very enlarged lymph node. This is in the left breast. So in radiology, we sort of look at everything backwards. Um, so the left breast is on the left side of the screen and the right breast is on the right side of the screen. Um, so she was presenting with this lump um, in her left underarm and we see this enlarged lymph node. So one of the basic tenets of breast imaging is looking for symmetry or asymmetry. So if you compare that area to the image on the left side of the screen or the right mammogram, you'll see there's a, a big structure that's not there on both, on both sides. So there's an enlarged lymph node in her left underarm, which again was the side that she received the vaccine just a couple of weeks earlier. So the image on the right side of the screen is from her ultrasound. So we um, further evaluated this lymph node um, with ultrasound, which we usually do for any patient that feels a lump in their underarm or their breast. And we can see that this lymph node is abnormal. So the dark um, sort of C-shaped tissue on the screen is the cortex of the lymph node. And it's much more thickened um, than it should be. And so this can be for a number of different causes, um, but we have to exclude breast cancer or even lymphoma as a possibility. Next slide, please. So these are just a couple of images so you can compare our patient's abnormal lymph node on the left side of the screen to a normal looking lymph node on the right side of the screen. So you can see that darker area, the cortex is much thicker than it is in the normal lymph node on the right side. Um, so this is sort of an extreme case. Um, this lymph node is much thicker than most of the, the enlarged lymph nodes that I've seen um, in patients who have recently received the COVID vaccine. So I actually recommended that this patient undergo a biopsy. Um, so her results are pending. Next slide, please. So since we've seen this rush of enlarged lymph nodes on mammograms and other breast imaging tests, the Society of Breast Imaging actually issued a statement because uh, departments were starting to feel overwhelmed. What should we do with these patients? Um, so in terms of screening mammograms, they recommend that patients either schedule their vaccine either um, after their mammogram or they schedule um, their mammogram four to six weeks after the final dose of the vaccine. So both of these um, recommendations allow for lymph nodes to return more or less to their normal size before um, taking any pictures. Uh, we do have to remember that the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines are two doses and the J&J &J vaccine is a single dose. So this would affect um, the scheduling. And the point of all this is really to reduce the number of false positive mammogram results and additional unnecessary tests that come as a result. Um, and then in sort of a different set of patients, um, if abnormal lymph nodes are already seen on breast imaging exams, um, the patients are given an abnormal result. Uh, we do request additional imaging for further evaluation. And when that patient uh, returns to us for the additional imaging, if um, we do not see any abnormalities within the breast itself, then we recommend that the patient come back in four to 12 weeks after their um, second dose. So we basically, um, again, want to allow time for the lymph nodes to return to normal size. And if they are still abnormal four to 12 weeks after the second dose, 
at that point, it's time to consider biopsy. Um, most lymph nodes related to the vaccine should have gone back to normal by that time. So we have to rule out any additional causes. Next slide, please. Um, so some takeaway points from all of this, um, the recommendations will likely evolve with time. Um, these vaccines are still relatively new and we're still learning um, about their effects. Um, every breast imaging department is different, of course. Um, so if you are considering getting the vaccine and scheduling your appointment, um, you may want to find out what their recommendations are um, at the facility that you're planning on scheduling your exam. Uh, for instance, at my institution, we are recommending that patients postpone their screening mammogram exams for a few weeks. Um, but if someone is, you know, really insisting on getting their exam at, at that time, we do not turn them away. Um, so again, you may want to consider postponing your mammogram a few weeks. If you do receive an abnormal result from your mammogram shortly after the, vac um, the vaccine, don't panic because it is possible that the abnormal result is related to the vaccine. Um, and just a side note, most abnormal screening mammogram results do not end up being cancer. Um, we just see something and we do need to perform some additional testing in order to find out what is going on in the breast. And then finally, if you ever notice a lump in your breast or underarm or any new changes that you're concerned about, please tell your healthcare provider. Uh, we want to make sure that they examine you and then order any appropriate testing. Next slide, please. So now we are moving into our question and answer period. Thank you, uh, Dr. Markham, Dr. Graff, and Dr. Green for providing a comprehensive overview of breast cancer, COVID-19, and vaccines. So at this time, I'd like to ask our panel to join us all for a few questions submitted by our attendees. So what about concern for an estrogen spike with vaccine, especially for those with estrogen dominant cancers? So and I, anyone? If, <laughs> yeah, so I don't, I think that that is another, the media headline hasn't quite told the whole story. It's not that the vaccine causes an estrogen spike. It's that women react differently to the vaccine itself than men because estrogen is um, good for our immune systems. Um, it's why women have more autoimmune diseases than men. It's why women tend to have more medication reactions um, than men. And it's one of the things that keeps us healthy as women and mothers, um, that we've got this straight, fan this fantastic responsive immune system that helps us um, have less illnesses, which is, which is really good for us um, as we live in our multiple different roles. Um, what we see with the COVID vaccine is that because of the estrogen effect on our immune system, and because the vaccine is that reactogenic, it makes our immune system go crazy for a day or so. Um, a lot of the times women will feel that more acutely because of our higher naturally occurring estrogen levels. So women on estrogen suppressive therapy for treatment of cancer, regardless of what sort of cancer it is, may have um, less of that reactogenic effect, which is probably a good thing. You'll feel better. Uh, getting the vaccine. Um, interestingly, because testosterone has the opposite effect, it tends to suppress the immune system. Men on cancer treatment that su uh, suppresses their testosterone, like for prostate cancer, for example, um, may have more reaction. Okay, thank you for that, Dr. Graf. Uh, since breast cancer screenings have been delayed, is the cancer when detected in a more advanced stage Um, so um, the answer is maybe and yes. Um, it really depends on how quickly the cancer grows. So there are many, a number of different types of cancers. Um, so not breast cancer is not just one entity and the different types can behave differently. Um, some cancers do grow relatively quickly and some cancers remain what we call indolent or they stay about the same size potentially for years. Um, it's hard to predict whose cancer is going to behave which way. 
Um, unfortunately, I have seen a number of cancers that I do suspect we would have found at a smaller um, stage if the patients had come in much sooner. So I've seen patients who have delayed their um, cancer screening or follow-up imaging for a year or a little bit more um, at this point, especially patients who were already a little bit overdue for their breast imaging exam when the pandemic started, and then they were afraid to come in and have waited the entire year. Um, so we, we do suspect that some of the cancers that we are seeing um, are at an advanced stage, unfortunately, um, due to some of the breast imaging delays. Should our patients be concerned about specific vaccines and the impact they may have on long-term hormonal regulation? So again, we don't necessarily know what our long-term side effects of the vaccines are going to be, but we don't have any clear evidence that it would have a long-term impact on our hormonal balance, uh, positively or negatively. Um, so I, at this point, I think it's probably not. I still think that the virus itself is a bigger concern, um, but it's an unanswered question. I'm concerned about getting the vaccine and thinking of waiting for herd immunity. What is that and when is it achieved? So I can take this one. Um, the dilemma with herd immunity is that it does take probably somewhere between 70 and 80% of the general population to get vaccinated. It is very unlikely that we're going to achieve that anytime soon with current vaccine rates. And with people hesitant and wanting to wait, that delays it even longer. So the best thing that anyone can do to help get us to herd immunity is actually get vaccinated. Should a patient that is actively in breast cancer treatment get the vaccine during treatment? And if not, then how long after treatment is complete? I hopefully answered that during my talk. I think it depends on the timeline of when your treatment is going to end, if it's going to end, um, relative to your risk of contracting the virus and your health, uh, health issues if you would contract the virus. Is it safe to return to a normal routine after getting the vaccine? So the vaccine takes a couple of weeks to become fully effective. And I think this holds true for, for all of them in general. And I think none of us really are at that point where we can return to normal activities quite yet, right? So we are certainly dependent on, on guidance from public health experts. And this, this be, is a public health issue. So I think in your own lives, it's good to consider your own health and safety and the health and safety of your family but we do all um, really owe it to our friends and neighbors to consider public health implications as well. So there are things that you can do when you've been vaccinated for at least two weeks since your last dose of vaccine. And that is things like be outside without having to wear a mask. If you're in a large crowd, wearing a mask is probably a good idea, but you can exercise outside, you can hang out with other vaccinated people who are in your same household and probably with other vaccinated people in general. Um, it is always a good idea though to wear a mask um, if you are in a setting where uh, there are people who you know to be unvaccinated and who are high risk of developing COVID-19. Um, so again, encourage um, your friends and family to get vaccinated so we can all return to life as we as it used to be. Uh, really we're breast cancer. Can oh, go ahead. Um, and as Dr. Graff mentioned, none of the vaccines, although they are highly effective, none have been shown to be 100% effective. Um, so we are seeing breakthrough infections. Um, most of those infections are not severe disease, but some are. Um, and you can have a breakthrough infection and still potentially spread um, the virus to others. So there's still things that we're learning about, but um, these vaccines are not 100% um, effective. So we still have to take some precautions. So can getting the vaccine generate further stress on my body? 
And is there a change in long COVID symptoms after getting vaccinated? There's been some really interesting data that's starting to emerge from Yale um, on the vaccine and long COVID um, that suggests that what I guess one of the leading theories is probably how or leading uh, thoughts about long COVID is that persons that have long COVID may actually um, be harboring levels of the virus in their body for a long time in, um, in what we call harbor sites, which is sort of the similar concept to how breast cancer hides from our treatment and then recurs, right? Um, and it's that constant low level of hiding virus in your body that you just don't clear that creates those chronic long COVID symptoms. And so the data from Yale has shown that persons with long COVID that uh, went on to get the vaccine, that up to 40% of them had an improvement in their long COVID symptoms in theory because the vaccine helped clear the virus from those harbor sites. And that a very low percentage had, an inc had any sort of ill effects of the vaccine, uh, paralleling what we've seen in terms of how the vaccine affects us as a population as a whole. So for those with long COVID, I think the data right now says, go get the vaccine. So a follow-up to that would be, are there any long-term effects of COVID-19 on an advanced stage breast cancer survivor, age groups 40 to 70? Of the virus itself or the vaccine? Of the virus, of the virus. Um, well, again, we, we don't know yet. Um, Presumably, either you still have long COVID symptoms or you don't. Um, long COVID symptoms, I think, have been well described, and you guys are all probably familiar. Um, but we don't know what the long-term implications are of, of infection, whether it was a mild infection or a serious infection, and then how those are going to affect us long-term. We, we are seeing some suggestions of what may be long-term outcomes, especially in patients who had severe cases of the disease and have been hospitalized. Um, just in the radiology department, we're seeing a lot of CT scans and some patients have really significant lung damage um, to the extent that it's not likely that um, their lungs will heal or go back to normal function. So although we don't, we can't predict the future, um, there is a strong suggestion that some patients will have very long and significant effects. Are there any interactions from the vaccines that might interfere with aromatase inhibitors and bisphosphonates that might make the vaccine less effective? Not, uh, not that we know of. Um, again, our immune, as women, our immune system is mediated in part by our hormones, but not having hormones would not make your immune system not work. Um, that's why men don't just walk around chronically ill. So um, I think that persons on bisphosphonates or aromatase inhibitors, tamoxifen, um, will all have um, similar efficacy in response to the vaccine. Is there a unique or individualized message for the young adult breast cancer patient as it relates specifically to the J&J &J vaccine and rare events that have occurred in young women. Dr. Markham, I was pausing to see if you wanted to take one. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, so, you know, the, the, the vaccine, the, Blood clotting events that we're seeing with the J and J vaccine are not mediated by the same mechanism that, like birth control or tamoxifen, causes blood clots. Um, it is it is mediated more closely to to something like heparin induced thrombocytopenia. We have a disease where if we give people heparin, they can develop blood clots. Um, so it is a very very different mechanism of action. And so as a young person living with breast cancer or beyond breast cancer, potentially on tamoxifen, potentially on oral contraceptives, that would not, in my opinion, be a contraindication to getting the COVID-19 vaccine, nor do I think it would increase your risk of developing the particular side effect profile of the blood clot seen with the J&J &J vaccine. These truly seem to be random events. 
Um, and we may see a slight propensity to those events in women, again, because we have better immune systems. Well, thank you very much. Um, so in the interest of time, we're going to close our webinar. Uh, reminder to everybody, the webinar will be available on our website. And we want to thank Dr. Graff, Dr. Green, and Dr. Markham for this informative and insightful presentation on the breast cancer COVID-19 conundrum. I also want to encourage our viewers to visit our website. If you're interested in learning more about the foundation or making a donation in support of our mission to end breast cancer, your donation is a direct investment in our research initiatives. So we thank you in advance for your consideration. Thank you to everybody joining us today and I hope all of you are staying safe and healthy.